would like to introduce you to Ed Scotus. And Ed, you have your mic on? I do. All right, awesome. So a little bit of background. Ed got me started in computer security. No comment? Thank you. <laughs> Ed got me started at the Sands Institute as an instructor. No comment. Thank you. And we were talking about it last night, and we were coming up with like lame security jokes. And one that we came up that we thought was really great is everybody calls it red teaming. That's, that's actually a mistake. 13 years ago, the first time I heard of it, it was ed teaming. Oh. So it's just been, oh, it's been oh. calling that uh, for a long time. Oh boy, oh boy. So Ed is more than a mentor. He's more than a friend. He's basically a member of my family. And uh, you know, it's just an absolute honor to have him here with us. And some people also have Ed in, his, in their extended family. Um, it'd be a really weird family reunion. Oh boy, this is it. Together. Yeah, this is it. This is close to it. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to the mastermind of SANS 504, the mastermind of Counterhack, the mastermind of Holiday Hack Challenges, uh, Mr. Ed F, don't even ask me what the F stands for, SCOTUS. Uh, thank you, Johnny. Oh boy. Oh my goodness. It's so great to see you all here. My gosh, it's like, I was talking to my wife this morning, and I said, it's like all my friends are here, like every last one of them. And uh, it is such an honor to be able to talk to you. Uh, for those of you that I haven't met, as John just said, my name is Ed Scotus. I have some stuff I'd like to share with you, and then we'll open it up for Q&A at the end of this. The presentation is called The Top 10 Reasons It's Great to Be a Pen Tester. And just as important, how you can help fix that problem. Now, how many here are pen testers? Raise your hand if you're a pen tester. OK. It looks like about maybe a third of the people here. Uh, raise your hand if you're not a pen tester. Ooh, that looks like about 80% of the people. You do the math. OK, figure that out. Um, this presentation is for both pen testers and non-pen testers. I'd like to go over some stuff I've been seeing in the industry and some recommendations I have for you. Now, some of this is rather tongue in cheek, and some of it is really dead serious. I hope to give you some fun, some ideas, some techniques, some stuff you can apply. I also hope not to plunge to my death off this stage, but if I do, Kennedy's gonna come up here, Karate Kid Kennedy is gonna come up here and seamlessly pick up the presentation, right? Excellent, feel, we yeah, are all set. I'll, yep. I'll feel real bad about it too. Oh, thank you. I don't know where you are, Clark, but uh, I appreciate that. Okay, so we move to the next slide. Caveat, not all pen testers are doing things the way I'm about to describe for you. Okay, yeah, it's a kind of a horrifying picture there for you. Um, the fact is, it's good to be a pen tester, right? I mean, the whole presentation is top 10 reasons why it's great to be a pen tester. It's good to be a pen tester, but not every pen tester is the way I'm about to describe. A lot of you, a lot of they, a lot of them are this way. There are enough pen testers that do things the way I'm about to describe that it is a problem for our industry, and we need to work together to fix that problem. So we're going to start. So top 10 reasons it's great to be a pen tester. First, you get to be cranky and weird, and people will think you're smart. You've seen this, right? You've seen this at your favorite con. Maybe you've seen it from some of the people that are quite famous in this industry. Look. I'm OK with being cranky a little bit now and then. It happens to all of us, right, Ted? Thank you. Thank you. Um, but and weird is good. I mean, weird is fine. But it's when it gets nasty, I think, that it's a problem. Let me, let me tell you a little story. Anybody here familiar with jazz musician Thelonious Monk? Yeah, Thelonious Monk. I was playing some of his music when we started up this morning. Thelonious Monk was a genius. He did some amazing stuff in jazz. But he was a little weird. He would play stuff kind of atonally, and he didn't hit the beat, but it was on purpose, because he was trying to send a message, create a texture, create a tone. And people thought Thelonious Monk was a genius. To help underscore how much of a genius he was, he purposely did very eccentric things. Thelonious Monk would often perform at the piano. He was a jazz pianist. He would perform at the piano wearing strange things on his head. He would wear a woman's girdle on his head. He would wear a lampshade on his head. And people, that, that kind of fueled the, the sort of mystique of Thelonious Monk. Look at what a genius he is. He wears a girdle on his head, right? So, and I think there's some people in our industry who are kind of like that. They accentuate their own eccentricities to seem kind of weirder or cooler. I'm not saying I don't do this myself. In fact, let me show you a picture here. Tell you a little story. Two days ago, I say to my wife, hey, um, do you still have that girdle you, you, you had so many years ago when we got married? She's like, I, I don't think so. I think I've thrown it away. 
And uh, I said, well, could you look for me? She's like, well, why? I said, I need it for a talk that I'm working on. So she looked through her closet. She looked through another closet. She looked through all the drawers, and she couldn't find one. And I said, at the dinner table with my son sitting there, I said, well, could you buy a, a girdle for me? Because I really need one for this talk. And my wife said, OK, sure enough, she'll, she'll go out and, and buy one for me. Um, she gets to the girdle store? I don't really know. I'm sorry, I'm not an expert on this kind of thing. She gets to the store. She FaceTimes me. And she says, what about this one? She's not wearing it. She's holding it up, OK? What about this one? And I say, no, that one's a little too raunchy. Can we kind of dial it down just a little bit? And she's like, how about this one? And I'm like, sequins. I like it. Why? Because I want it. I hope you can see it. I want to have a picture of me with a woman's girdle on my head, just like Thelonious Monk, right? Or maybe a lampshade on my head, right? Or how many people attended Worldwide Hack, uh, Wild West Hacking Fest last year? Raise your hand if you did. Do you remember the little session that we did up in front where John Strand, my dear friend, bought me the gift of a flapper dress complete with a little feather tiara for, for wearing. And of course, you can't turn that down when your, your dear friend buys you a flapper dress. So I wore that last year. Um, Dave Kennedy, of course, was dressed as a cockroach, very handsome cockroach, I think. Uh, we've got the rodeo clown that is John Strand. By the way, Mr. Strand, could you come up to the stage, please? I got something for you here. And then finally, we have Larry Pesci dressed as a milkshake, complete with a set of cockroaches that he handed out to the rubber cockroaches, please, that he handed out to the audience. It was a, it was a, a beautiful, lovely moment that we shared. John, you look a little nervous. Um, anyway, so in putting this together, I understand weird. I understand eccentric. Believe me, I do. Um, but I wanted to share something with John, because I really don't have another use for it. And this is a gift. You know, last year he bought me a flapper dress. And in putting this presentation together, I thought he would really enjoy this fine gift. Now, you wear it on your head, of course. For goodness sakes, do not wear that on your torso. Oh, that's so good. All right, yes. OK, good. Let's see here. Look pretty. All right. Yes. And I've got to do a selfie for this, too. Oh, my this, friend. Ed, mm -hmm. this really helps keep my head from getting too big. <laughs> it does, yes. And it'll keep you warm, too, and keeps the sun off. So ladies and gentlemen, John Strand, thank you for Wild West Hacking Fest. So cool. Now let me bring this down to a little more seriousness. Yeah, you know, weird, eccentric is OK. But cranky is borderline. Nasty's not good. Our industry, I think, has gotten itself into a place where there's a lot of, a lot of nastiness, a lot of bad vibes, people upset with other people. I encourage you, for the remainder of this week, this weekend, rolling into Wild West Hacking Fest over the next couple of days, um, embrace the community. I mean, we're all here together. We're hackers, right? You say, no, I'm not a pen tester. Hey, if you're a cyber defense professional, you're still a hacker. We all hack. There was a great tweet by Dan Kaminsky several years ago based on that old REM song, Everybody Hurts. Dan tweeted, everybody hacks. You all hack. We're all hackers. We're all part of the hacker community. Enjoy this time. Savor this time. Don't be cranky. You could be weird. You could be eccentric. Believe me, I know. But cherish this time together. The, the folks, the staff here, John, everybody at Black Hills has worked so hard to put this thing together. All those staff members there, see all the, the, the blue shirts, staff members? If you're a staff member, please uh, kind of wave your hand here a little bit so we can see you better. Let's give them a round of applause. They're working their tails off for us. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys, sincerely. My hat's literally off to you. OK, next. So top 10 reasons it's great to be a pen tester. Number two, bling babes and great hair. Right? No? Would uh, Dave Kennedy please come up to the stage, please? Oh, no. So anyway, for this look, I was kind of going for smoldering, is what I was trying to do. And my daughter, for Christmas last year, she bought me something. And she said, what do you get for the man who has everything? My daughter was 20 years old last year. And she came up with this idea. She said, well, there's one thing my dad does not have. So she bought it for me. Long flowing locks of hair. So it's a wig that my daughter gave me. And I well, wanted to take this picture. I took this picture a couple days ago. And I thought, you know, what would I love to share with my good friend Dave Kennedy, the man who has everything? There you go. <laughs> the karate kid. Hey, you want to try it on? Sure, yes. All right, there you go. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Dave Kennedy. 
Yay. Wow. You look better than that than I do. You look like Howard Stern, dude. Here, let me take a quick picture. Can I take a picture? No, no, you're running away. Don't run away. Woo. All right. Smoldering. Go for smoldering. You look like Keith Myers in that, actually. <laughs> All right. So there we go. Thank you, guys. All right. Dave, thanks. Enjoy that. You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Next. Let's get a little more serious here, but not completely. So the next one for you is money. Wow. Penetration testers, you can look at salary surveys and penetration testers make among the highest salaries of all information security personnel. I'm not gonna discuss here whether that's appropriate or not. Maybe I'll get into that a little bit later. But the fact is, you can look at the salary surveys, pen testers make good money. Industry is booming. I know this, why? Because I hire penetration testers. I was talking with John Strand, I was talking with Dave Kennedy last night. Y'all are getting expensive, which I mean is good for you. This is a sign of a, a healthy industry and so forth. But salaries keep going up and up and up. And at the end of the day, we need to sell your services to our customers and make sure they're willing to pay. The reason your salaries are going up is because the customers are still willing to pay that. Your employers are still willing to pay that. This is a wonderful thing. Savor it. I don't know if it will last forever. The pen test industrial complex. Trees don't grow to the sky. There's got to be some limit at what they will pay pen testers. I haven't found it yet. Maybe you haven't either. This is a wonderful thing, right? But yeah, business is booming, booming. All right, so that's a great reason to be a pen tester, right? Next, you can have as much travel as you want in this industry. You want to travel a lot? Great. We'll give you more travel than you could possibly handle. Travel enough to make you sick. I was just talking with a, a friend a couple of weeks ago at uh, DerbyCon, and he had gotten a job offer that uh, was 75% travel. And he was talking to me about whether he should take the job or not, and I said, um, you know, 75% travel is a lot of travel. And he's like, oh yeah, I got that. Do you really understand what 75% travel is? You've got a family, a young family. You've got a whole bunch of people at home that are depending on you. They're not gonna see you that often. Have you discussed this with them? I urge you to think about this really carefully. Now, there are pen test positions where you can go with lower travel. In fact, I'm gonna give you some advice a little bit later on how to try to lower the travel that you do so you can spend more time with those people that you love or at least those people that tolerate you that live in the same house. All right? Um, but there is a lot of travel in this industry. Wow. I remember when I first started my job in pen testing, I was a younger man, and uh, I thought this was the coolest thing. I was an idiot. I'll be honest with you. I was an idiot. Um, I thought this was so cool. My travel budget, so the amount of money I'd spend on airplanes and hotels, exceeded my salary. I thought this was novel and really cool because it showed how big of a big shot I was. What an idiot. Yeah, yeah. I remember also thinking, I'm traveling 75 to 85% of the time. I really don't need an apartment or home because I'm living out of hotels. I thought this was cool. I was 25 at the time. I realize now that is not a long-term good way to live, okay? Now your mileage may vary, maybe you like that, but it's probably not the way you wanna live for the next 20 years of your life. Think about that as you're working through your job. All right, so that's number three. Oh, number, that was number four. Next, squishy definitions. Have you seen this in our industry? What the heck is a pen test? The fact that there is no real hard and fast defined widely accepted definition of a pen test is actually kind of good for pen testers because you can say, this is a pen test. How do you know? I'm a pen tester. I did it. By definition, it is a pen test. This is not a healthy thing for the industry. But there are people who will call vulnerability assessment a pen test. Why PCI DSS section 11.2 and 11.3? Payment card industry, data security standard, section 11.2 says you need to get vulnerability assessment. Section 11.3 says, and you need to get pen tests. It says they're not the same thing. But there are companies out there that will say, hey, we could sell you one service that gives you both. And what it ends up being is a pretty badly executed vulnerability assessment but they're looking for customers who want to check the box. I'm going to get into that in more detail a little bit later. But what is the definition of pen testing? There are various definitions that have been offered up. We have one that we cover in, in some of the SANS classes that talks about how we as pen testers model what real world bad guys do so that we can discover flaws and under controlled circumstances exploit those flaws following our scope and rules of engagement to help better understand business risk and better manage that business risk. Notice the emphasis. It's focused on business risk. 
Not merely finding flaws and eliminating them. That's good, that's important, but managing business risk is what you should focus on as a pen tester. So with these squishy definitions, what's an audit? Is an audit a pen test? No, it's not, it's a different thing. Well, what's the difference? An audit is measuring you against certain particular specifications, such as maybe ITIL or COBIT or, or maybe even PCI DSS itself. PCI DSS is an audit specification that requires Vuln assessments and requires pen tests. So all three kind of touch there at that one point. These definitions are squishy, and this reminded me of a quote from Through the Looking Glass. So I was talking with my staff last week about how I needed to put together some pictures of myself for this presentation, and I remembered this quote, I looked it up online, and it was from Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty said this when he was talking with Alice and Through the Looking Glass, and it reminds me of what some pen testers I've heard seem to think when it comes to pen testing. So my staff said, well, Ed, clearly for a picture, we're gonna need you to look like Humpty Dumpty. So there I am sitting on the wall, uh-huh, but the quote is this. Does anybody recognize those legs? Raise your hand if you recognize those legs. You know what they are? They are gnome in the home, which was our own take in Elf on the Shelf back in 2015. I keep those little legs in my office. My daughter made those legs for us a few years ago. By the way, Holiday Hack Challenge 2015, Gnome in Your Home is up. It's running all the time. All of our Holiday Hack Challenges for the last 10 years are still up and running, so you can practice anytime. There's 10 holiday-themed cyber ranges for you for free. And I pay for hosting out of my own pocket. Enjoy them, they're up there for you. Just go to holidayhackchallenge.com. But anyway, so we took the little legs, we put them under my neck, they made me wear a white shirt, I got this tiny little hat, and that's me. And I showed my wife, and she's like, well, you do have an egg-shaped head. Thanks, dear, appreciate that. But here's the quote. When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said, in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. So pen testing, what does pen testing mean? It means what I say it means. And there you go, I just delivered to you a pen test. And darn it, if I might say so, it's a really good one too. This is part of a problem in our industry that there's no kind of standards to hold people to to say this is not a very good pen test. There are some efforts out there. The pen test execution standard came out several years ago. Anybody remember that? Raise your hand. Chris Nickerson did a bunch of that work with a bunch of other people, volunteers. It's still up and it defines a very solid, very thorough pen test, but it's not widely accepted as an industry standard. It is a wonderful goal to try to attain, and I do encourage you, if you haven't seen it, to look at the pen test execution standard. All right, so that's number five of the top 10 reasons why it's great to be a pen tester. Number six, many orgs don't want to change. This kind of follows on with what I was talking about before. If you look at like PCI, it requires, it mandates, depending on the number of credit card transactions your organization deals with, it mandates that you get pen testing and vulnerability assessment. But a lot of organizations, the last thing they want when they get a pen test is to actually have to do anything afterwards. They're looking to check the box with their pen, pen test. All right, I'm sorry. Look, that's the best I got, okay? <laughs> So pen test, so congratulations, you just got a pen test, but the last thing they want is to actually have to change what they do for keeping their sel themselves into production. And even those orgs that want a really good pen test, they want their money to be used for something valuable, they often can't differentiate the providers. One of the things I see all the time on mailing lists is, how do I know if my pen test company is actually doing a good job? You need to insist, you need to talk with them about what it is they're going to do. And look at their reports, look at their deliverables. I've got some tips for the pen testers in the room here on how to create better reports. I also have some tips for those non-pen testers on how to evaluate your pen testers and the reports to see if they're worth what you're paying. All right, so that's number six. Let's see, next one. Number seven. This one's very near and dear to my heart. I am so this one, I'm telling you. You get to blow stuff up. You get to break things. Some other poor person is the one that has to deal with the aftermath. I've been in my career as an information security professional for about 20 years now. It's a little bit more than 20, it's 22 years. And uh, when I started, the first 10 years of my career, I tried to balance to be offense and defense. That was what I did. I wanna do all things incident handling and penetration testing, I tried to do both. And I, I did my best for it for 10 years. And finally, after 10 years, I said, I can't keep doing these both at the level that I wanna deliver value to my clients. So I had to choose, choose offense, or defense. Honestly, I'll tell you, because I'm a weak man, I chose offense. It's easier, it's more fun. 
I, I'll, I'll tell you right now, defense is hard, just like Ken says here. Um, being a pen tester, I want to be more than just a monkey throwing poo. Um, by the way, I did draw that uh, little graphic there. I, I don't know why, I just kind of thought, hey, there should be a caution sign for that kind of thing. Um, I try to be more than just a monkey throwing poo, but I realize at the end of the day, I'm just breaking stuff and somebody else has to fix it. But I caution you on this one too. One of the things that I've been saying for years is the reason pen testing exists, or if you want to go even further, the reason red exists, red teaming, is to make blue better. Tim Medine, I saw him earlier back there. Is Tim still around? He fell asleep. Anyway, so Tim um, tweeted the other day, the purpose of red is to make blue better. Never lose sight of that. I talk to a lot of pen testers in my business. Talk to a lot of folks. Try to encourage them, try to support them. But I always try to remind them, your job as a pen tester is not merely to blow stuff up and just dump it in somebody else's lap so that they can fix it. Your job is to help improve the state of security, or else you're not doing your job right. So you need to relentlessly focus on that. I saw a presentation a few years ago by Tony Sager. Tony Sager worked for a small little organization. You may have heard of them. They're called the National Security Agency. And uh, he worked on their uh, blue teams and their red teams. And Tony said something in a presentation that he did. And he said, here's what I see with most red team presentations and most red team projects. And, and it's a mistake that they make. And when I first heard him start the story, I'm like, I bet you I don't make that mistake. Nope, nope, I'm going to hear what everybody else does wrong, and, and I'm sure I'm going to be better than that. And Tony said, if you look at their reports, what the reports of most red teamers, and I'll add pen testers, what their reports are focused on is impressing other red teamers. And Tony got my attention. I'm like, well, yeah. I want people who do the stuff that I do to be impressed with the stuff that I did, because that shows that I did it well, right? And Tony said, you're writing for the wrong audience. The purpose of red is to help improve the state of blue. You need to make sure that your reports, your results, your findings are there helping the blue team, especially from an operations perspective, do their job better. If you're just saying, hey, here's this flaw, good luck fixing it, because I have no idea, you're not doing your job well. I remember it was two years ago. I was working on a pen test with my team. We had this finding. I can't get, give you the details, but it was um, an Internet of Things device, and we hacked the crap out of it. It was awesome, this flaw we found. And we're trying to come up with a recommendation. I mean, this is going to require an architectural change to this product, or else really, really bad stuff could happen. And we spent weeks trying to think of a defense against the attack that we had devised. It was me, it was Josh Wright, it was a couple other people on my team, and we were brainstorming and brainstorming and brainstorming. We did finally come up with a defense that not only this company implemented, but we saw their competitors implement this shortly after they did too, which makes you feel kind of good, right? You help improve the state of the industry, helping Blue do its job better. But sometimes it can be hard to think of a defense to a very novel attack, but we must. That's what this is all about. Right? We want to be more than just a monkey throwing poop. Next, our industry is obsessed with novelty. Blinky, shiny, tell me the latest hack. Oh my gosh, what did you do? I do a presentation every year at RSA. I do it with Johannes Ulrich. We do it with uh, James Line. Uh, Heather Mahalik is going to be doing it with us uh, this year. We're really super excited about it. Um, and uh, we also have Mike Asante. And the purpose of this presentation, the whole title of it, we've done it for over 10 years, is the top seven new attacks and what you need to know about them. And we're looking for all these new attacks, right? We want to talk about novel stuff, scary stuff, freaky stuff. And every time we do this talk, which is a delight to do, by the way, every time somebody emails me or says, dude, you know, you still get in via spear phishing every time. Yeah, but if I were to every year at RSA say, spear phishing, nobody would kind of show up. So, but there's this, this desire, this want of novelty. Show me the new attack. And look, bad guys and security researchers are constantly coming up with new kinds of attacks. I'm going to talk about a new one in just a few minutes. But the fact is, novelty is important. We need to be abreast of the latest attacks. But realize, if you're a pen tester and you keep throwing the same attacks against your same target customers and they're still working, you might say, well, that's their fault. No, I, I think you have some responsibility and culpability there, too. You need, remember I told you, your job as a pen tester is to help Blue do better. If you're using your same attacks again and again and again, you're not doing your job. A Diet Pepsi has leapt to its death up here on stage. We will mourn it later, but uh, yeah, it's a very sad sight. All right, anyway, 
So the point here is you gotta do your job. If you're applying the same hacks all the time and they're still working, you gotta work with them to think outside the box, think bigger kinds of defenses, more enterprise defenses. This is something that John Strand and I talk about all the time. You know, different ways to evade endpoint security suites. If you've not seen any of the tipping sacred cows webcasts that are done by the Black Hills information security staff, you are doing yourself a disservice. You must watch this. Anybody here see tipping sacred cows? Yeah, if you haven't seen them, you gotta see them. It's a whole series of webcasts that they do. What do you tip a sacred cow, by the way? Is 15% standard or is it 18? I told that joke at a conference about a year ago, and a guy came up to me, and he said, look, Ed, I know you're from New Jersey. You do realize that tipping cows is actually a thing that, I'm like, yeah, dude, I know, okay? I, I do live in New Jersey, but we have a couple of cows. They're very nice, you should meet them. Um, anyway, so the point here is don't phone it in. Do different attacks. If you find that you can phone it in and do the same attacks all the time, you need to help your target system personnel, your customers, or if you're an in-house pen tester, your own company get ahead of those attacks and defeat those attacks that have been working with you year after year after year. Next one. You have lots of friends as a pen tester. Oh my gosh, is it great. I mean, not only do you have 500 people at Wild West Hacking Fest, but you have many other friends. I'm talking technological friends. As a pen tester, let me think. Who, who are my best friends? I, I don't know if you can see that so well. Can anybody see that logo on that pillow? Java. Java is such a great, don't you love Java? I mean, did, no you don't? Oh, you're a defender. If you're an attacker, don't you just love Java? It's the most wonderful thing. Yes, oh, and another one that we love, watch this. What's that? Flash, don't you just love, no, it's not Facebook, it's Flash, different color, right? It's Flash, you love Flash, oh my gosh, thank you Adobe for this gift of Flash. It's one of the things that lets me phone it in if I want to phone it in. Oh, and you know my favorite one of all, anybody? Who's your best friend as a pen tester? You, got, you like yourself some Java, yummy, yummy Java. You like yourself some Flash, but can you, <laughs> PHP, PHP's a nice one, that's a good friend, but this one is the best friend. Can you see it, it's kind of a little small up there. Can anybody see what that request and response is? S, M, B, server message block. Well, what's server message block for? You say, well, it's authentication to a Windows environment, and a file sharing, and printing. And, well, isn't that it? No, it's, oh, you say PS exec. And everything, time, service control, everything you want, right over one deliciously beautiful little port, TCP 445. Oh my goodness, that's just so awesome. I love SMB. If you don't love SMB, let me help to encourage your appreciation of this tremendous protocol. One of the things that I said you could use SMB for is managing services. There is a Windows command line tool that you could use to do that. It is called the S, it's two letters, C, thank you, the SC command, the services controller command. My team was doing a penetration test back in July and they discovered something that is really wonderful. Did you see the vulnerability that was announced yesterday for WebEx? Did anybody see that? Raise your hand if you saw it. It's fun, isn't it? Have you played with it yet? Oh, it is so good. So back in July, so that was what, three months ago, something like that? My guys, Ron Bose and Jeff McJunkin, were doing a penetration test, and they discovered an issue with WebEx. You guys know WebEx, right? It's so you can kind of sit there and get you know, remote conferencing and all this kind of jazz. So one of the things that when you install WebEx on your Windows machine, what it does is it installs a service called the WebEx service. And that service is manageable via SMB, TCP port 445. And Ron Bose and Jeff McJunkin found this installed on one of our customer systems, did a lot of analysis of it, and determined that you can, with any logged in user, you don't need admin privileges, any user that has valid logins in a domain, you can go to any machine in that domain not necessarily domain controller, not necessarily server, but even clients, if you can SMB to clients, and as a non-admin user, you can start the WebEx service and trick the WebEx service into running any code you wanna run, any whatsoever. Oh, as system, as system. So it's remote code execution as a non-privileged administrative user across the network. It is beautiful, it's wonderful. And for those of you that can see it, um, it's just the little SC command. They've wrapped it up into some nicer things, but just SC backslash backslash target IP address, start your WebEx service, 
You then put in a little letter there, which just kind of means nothing. It just takes that argument and ignores it. And you're going to do software update. That's something you have to pass it. You give it a number one, which is another just sort of throwaway argument. Net local group administrators test user slash add. Boom, it adds a user for you. Thank you. Thank you. So that's WebEx for you. The team, Jeff and Ron Bose, did such a great job working with Cisco to address this problem over the last couple of months. Cisco released a patch about a month ago, but didn't fully describe what was in the patch. So we, they asked us to not go into detail with our release yet until they had enough time to make sure the patch got out to those customers that really needed it and so forth. So yesterday, Cisco posted the advisory associated with this, and my team released a, an Nmap script for finding this flaw. They released another Nmap script for exploiting the flaw. It's Ron Bose. Ron Bose like, lives and breathes Nmap scripts. And uh, then Ron also developed a Metasploit module for exploiting it. All of that was released yesterday. Um, there's a nice detailed write-up of this thing at webexec.org. And it works beautifully, super stable. Now, you do need to have an admin login. So this is not going to work anonymously. But once you get in through password guessing, or as you'll see, I'm going to recommend how you structure your pen test going forward. Once you get one non-elevated account, this thing will give you system on target systems throughout the environment, except for Windows 10. Just so you know, this doesn't work against Windows 10 unless you have an admin user. Which you already have an admin user, it'll give you a system, which is nice. But if you're on Windows 7, if you're on Windows 8, if you're on Windows 8, God help you, I'm sorry, or 8.1, or the Windows Server series, this works like a champ. And they came up, the guys came up with a wonderful name for this and a logo. Because right, you got, a, you got a new exploit. We had this zero day for the last three months, right? You come up with a, a logo for it. You want to see the logo that Jeff McJunkin drew? Of course you do. Cisco Web Exec. There you go. It's, it, Jeff even tweeted yesterday. He's like, the thing practically named itself. It's like PS Exec using WebEx. Oh, and with PS Exec, you need admin privileges. With this, you don't. So it's like PS Exec plus plus. Awesome. Awesome. Anyway, SMB is your friend. I'm hoping this turns out to be a whole class of vulnerabilities. It's one vulnerability that we found in WebEx. But the idea is, if there is a service that you can start across SMB using the SC command, and you can trick that service into running commands for you as admin or system, it's the same thing that we've got here. And we've got a name for this class of vulnerabilities, if we can find more. Right now, we just have one. And it's called WebExec. But the name for the whole class of vulnerabilities is called Thank you for your service. <laughs> we'll see if we find more. I'm hoping we find more. The guys are looking for them right now. Maybe you'll find them and present on them next year at Wild West Hacking Fest. Sounds like a plan to me. All right, next. Number 10. I feel this one passionately. As a penetration tester, what's one of the top 10 reasons? Maybe even the number one reason. It's great to be a pen tester. You can write reprots that are the suck and people think it's OK. Oh my gosh, we, I mean, as an industry, we write horrifically bad reports. Really, really bad stuff. I read a lot of pen test reports, not only from my team. We try to make them as good as we can. But I also read reports from other pen testers. I do this as part of my expert witness work. And any given week, I'll see a, a report from another pen test company, two pen test companies, three pen test companies. And I can see, and I kind of grow familiar with which companies do really good work, because I see their reports, and which companies do really lousy work, because I see their reports. Also, for my own company, whenever we write a report, we don't just write the we don't just write the report and send it to the customer. We write the report, and then Josh Wright gets a hold of it. And Josh Wright is, he's like super fastidious about reports. He goes through it with a fine tooth comb, and that's the first round of review. And then I do second round of review, and we really try to make these things as good as they can possibly be. There's a lot of bad reports in this industry. It's crazy. I'm going to give you some more tips and techniques for creating good pen test reports that I think actually are more broadly applicable across different kinds of InfoSec reports as we move into our defenses. All right, so that's the top 10 reasons it's great to be a pen tester. It really is great to be a pen tester. I can't imagine anything I'd want to do more in my business life than be a pen tester. For those of you who aren't pen testers, that's OK. I respect you. Look, if you're a cyber defender, that's awesome. You're defending. You're like a superhero. If you're, if you're a forensics person, that's fantastic. You're taking the fight to the bad guys. That's fantastic. But for me, I love being a pen tester. So what's the problem if life is good for the pen tester? The problem is. This is a race to the bottom. 
There are companies that are growing bigger and richer because they're turning out really crappy pen tests. And there is an industry desire for these really crappy pen tests. So it's hurting our industry. In fact, it's kind of shaming the word pen test. People talk about, well, can we come up with a new term? Like, should we just call it red teaming? Well, what is red teaming and how does it differentiate from pen testing? I think of red teaming as focused pen testing so that pen testing generally is trying to find flaws to help people better manage their risk. Red teaming is a form of pen testing that is focused on helping the blue team specifically do better or to measure the blue team, you see? But this is a problem. Maybe we need another term, maybe not. We're stuck with pen testing right now. Now, I tried to take as many pictures as I could of myself for this presentation. For this slide on really crappy pen tests, I chose not to include a picture of myself because I thought that would be problematic, let's say, all right? So anyway, this gives rise to what I call the really crappy pen test, the RCPT. We need to avoid that and instead demand better. How can we, as pen testers, provide better services to our customers, stuff that helps them better manage their risk, and how can they demand more of us so that we can either clean up this mess that our industry has, or at least for those that are seeking quality, provide them that quality, okay? So I have 10 recommendations for you. First, when you're putting together a pen test, demand that pen testers use a good methodology that is focused on business value and transparency. One way to see that this is not being done is if you ever ask your pen testers, how did you find this flaw? How did you find this vulnerability? And they say, oh, we can't tell you. The vulnerability's there. Here's how you exploit it. But we use some sort of super secret voodoo magic to discover it. That's not good. You are paying them to explain to you your business risk. And I'm sorry, but voodoo magic does not help you understand your risk, right? I mean, if only this pen tester with his genius level IQ can find this thing. Sir, we need to get you a girdle for your head, right? Only this guy can find this thing. That doesn't sound like it's a very big risk to me. I mean, he just said, no offense, I'm sorry to pick on you, but you're sitting there. But he just said it's only voodoo black magic that gets this stuff. So it doesn't sound like I should defend against that. No, you got to explain risk in realistic terms with transparency. How did you find it? Now, we do develop a fair amount of code. Once we find some indication of a flaw, we might write a zero-day exploit for it, or we might write some code so that we can scan for it in the broad range. We deliver that code to our customers because our business model is not to sell code. We also say we can't support the code once we've given it to you. We also try to write things and contribute back to the industry like Metasploit modules and, and Nmap scripts and that kind of stuff. I understand if you go to a pen test provider and they say, well, here's how we found the flaw. Here's how somebody else could find the flaw. We wrote this code that helps us do this across enterprise scale, but we're not going to share that code with you. I get that. That's fine. They're not a software development house. They're a pen test provider, right? We give the code because we figure, what are we going to do with it, right? other than use it against other customers. So we give the code. But if a pen tester doesn't give you the code, that's fine, as long as they tell you how the code worked so you can understand your business risk. That's really the bottom line here. The focus is on business value. Never lose sight of that. I like to hack just because I like to hack. It is a beautiful thing to be able to hack for a living. That said, the only reason we're able to do that beautiful thing, hacking for a living, is because we're providing business value. And if we don't up our game in providing the business value, there's going to be less pen testing out there. The thing that I said, money, 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 earlier, that money, money, money is going to dry up unless we can continue to deliver, to deliver good business value and business results. Number two, you need to provide business goals, not technical goals. When somebody's formulating a pen test, if you're a pen tester, insist that they tell you what the business goal is for this pen test. The business goal might be as simple as, we need to pass our PCI audit. OK, fair enough. Then that translates into a goal of seeing if the credit card information when it's stored and transferred is being properly protected. Translate those things into business goals and then measure whether those goals are there. Ask them, why are you doing the pen test? What are you hoping to achieve? If they give you a goal of, we want to see if you can get domain admin in our environment, that's not a good goal for a pen test. That might be a means to a business goal, but getting domain admin by itself is not a business goal, right? It's a technical goal. Focus on the business goals. Look, I. I'm a pen tester. I'm a hacker. That's my identity. I do the business stuff because I need to do that so that I can hack and so that my team can hack. I don't want to have to constantly go back to those business goals, but the fact is that's how you, that's how you keep that stuff going. That's how you keep your customers coming back. That's how, if you're an in-house pen tester, it's how you keep the business units happy with you because you're providing that business value. So business goals. Number three, 
Lower travel costs through remote pen tests. I say this to my customers all the time, and I've got specific advice for you. Pretty much every pen test my company has done this year, we've done in this way, and I want to share it with you. I tell my customers, I would much rather have you spend your money on pen testing or mitigation, cyber defense, that kind of stuff, instead of airfare and hotel rooms for my team and me. I travel already 70% of the time, which is a lot, right? So I'd rather them spend their money on that. So how are we doing pen tests? Throughout this entire year, we started a couple years ago, but this whole year, pretty much every single pen test we've done has been done this way. We ask the customer, can you give us your standard image of a laptop that you would issue to a new employee? And give us your standard remote access, whatever it is. Maybe it's some sort of VPN or something like that. Maybe there's some sort of token, whatever it is, secure ID or some other token. Give us that as access as a normal user. That's what we want. And then our job is to see if we could do local privilege escalation on the image that you gave us, we're almost always able to do that. That WebEx vulnerability, if you go to webexec.org, you can read how Ron Bowes initially found that flaw based on a pen test that was structured in just this way. Customer gave us stuff, and we ran you know, power up and all the different sort of PowerShell stuff to try to do local privilege escalation. None of it worked quite right. We had some indication that some of the um, some of the uh, permissions weren't quite set right on some of the, the files that are associated with services, but then he dug into it, and he got local privilege escalation. Web exec started with local privilege escalation. Then after a couple of days, the guys realized, hey, we could do this across the network with the SC command. But it all started from, send us your standard image, we're gonna do local privilege escalation on that in our lab, and then we're going to use your standard non-admin access to your VPN and we're going to start exploring your internal network, seeing where we can get to, and we're going to do it in an evasive fashion. And we're not going to fly. And we're not going to stay in a hotel. We might at the end, you know, we're going to do like a final presentation or final report or something like that. Or I can save you money. Why don't we just do the final presentation via go to meeting? That's <laughs> all right. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Oh. oh, you can do it via whatever it is, right? So the point is save your money on travel, spend that money on information security whether it's pen testing or defense or whatever it happens to be. Really, it's a wonderful way to do pen testing. I'm loving it. I don't want to say I'll never do a pen test where they fly me out again, but I'm going to try to discourage them from that because I think you get more business. It's all about business value. Oh, you want me to give you another little tip? I got so many tricks. I've been doing this 20 years. You want to hear another little trick that I do? Have you ever had to do like a project and you got to do your final presentation? I might not want to say this because it's going to be recorded, but I'll tell, go ahead and say it. So, you know, I got a customer really important. They're going to fly me out. I got to meet with like the CIO or the CEO, maybe even the board. And, and there's going to be some technical people there too. And the question always comes up. I always ask, do I need to wear a suit? Do you ask that question? You kind of have to, right? Or, you know, I once testified in front of Congress. You know, you ask them, do I have to wear a suit? Congress said yes. But here's what I've learned since then. I'll always say, hey, you know, I just want to know what I need to wear when I'm going to meet, you know, the CIO or the board or something like that. And, uh, and before they answer, I always say, are there going to be technical people in the room? And they usually say, yeah, there's going to be a couple technical people there. And I say, well, look, I'm totally happy to wear a suit, totally happy. But I'm telling you, if I wear a suit, those technical people will not take me seriously. So I would prefer to wear kind of dockers and a dress shirt, and then the technical people will take me seriously. And because they take me seriously, so will your business leaders. So is that okay? Folks, I haven't had to wear a suit in five years. I don't like, I can wear a suit. I got a suit. It's old now, but um, anyway, that little tip, little trick. Just ask if there's going to be technical people there. Tell the business leaders they won't take you seriously if you're wearing a suit, and then they'll say, okay, sure, you don't have to wear a suit. If you like to wear suits, good for you. I don't care. But uh, anyway, lower your travel costs through remote pen tests. Next. All right, come on, next. Hello. Reject crappy reports and presentations. We really do need to kind of stomp this out. Um, if the report isn't any good, if you don't understand it, just get rid of it. I told you, I read all the reports that my company produces, and I don't want to name names of people in my company, but I was reading this one finding. I, I assume I'm an idiot. This has served me well in my life, right? I, I just assume I'm an idiot, and if I don't understand anything, it's because I'm stupid. It, it happens, right? But I still raise a flag. It's like, I'm, I'm sorry I'm an idiot. I apologize, but I don't understand this finding. And I'm saying this to some of the smartest people I know. And, you know, so I threw a flag on this one report that we had about two months ago. It's like, this one finding that you wrote up, I don't get it. I don't understand it. It's because I'm stupid. But I'm a proxy for our customer. 
I probably shouldn't have said that. But I'm a proxy for a customer. If I don't understand, it's probably that they're not going to understand it. And one of the guys on my team said, honestly, when I wrote that up, I won't say who it was on the team, but he said, when I wrote that up, I didn't understand it either. I'm like, OK, well, why don't we analyze this thing a little bit more we, so we can all understand it and explain it better to our customer? You need to reject crappy reports. You need to reject crappy presentations and say, go further. This is not providing to me the business value that I need. I don't understand it. Your job as a pen tester is to help me understand my business risk. If you aren't doing that, I'm not getting value out of you. And how much did I spend? And how much more did I spend this year than last year? You really got to focus on this. Your report, your presentation is the manifestation of the fact that you did your job. Next. Notice I keep moving over here to advance the slides. It's because my laptop is actually seven miles that way. And uh, it's the only way to get enough signal there to make it happen. Next, insist on real world solutions for problems. These problems can't just be solved in a theoretical fashion. If you are a pen tester and you come up with a recommendation, you need to ensure that your recommendation is operationalizable, if that's a word. Well, it is now, right? The definition is what I say it is, right? Just like Humpty Dumpty. It has to be able to be put in operations. Now, when I say this to some pen testers and some red teamers, they come back to me and say, look, Ed, like you, 12 years ago in my career, I decided to go entirely offensive. I have no freaking idea how to defend against this thing. Well, I say you got to step up. I say this to myself, too. I told you I was blue and red up until about 12 years ago. And then I went just red. But the fact is I try to keep my finger on the pulse of blue for two reasons. One is so I can do this. I can try to give them real world solutions, whether it be free open source stuff, vendor products, changes in technology, changes in policy, procedure. I want to make sure I know that so I can recommend it. And I want to know what's standard out there so I can get around it. You're not very good at offense if you don't understand the defenses and can't subvert them. In our industry, we say all the time, Offense informs defense, right? Defense also informs offense. Steel sharpens steel. You as an attacker, those third of you or so that are pen testers, you need to learn from your defensive friends what their defenses really are, how to make those defenses better, and how to subvert the darn things. You got to learn that. It's important, really important. All right, number six. You need to ask for methods to verify that a fix is in place or working. For this picture, I was going for that shining look, you know, hello, Johnny, that kind of thing. Did I, was it close? I did my best. I did my best. The idea is when you give recommendations in your penetration testing report and they apply that recommendation, how do they know it's working, that they've actually fixed the problem? And you say, well, they get a retest. There you go. We're selling another service, a retest. Yeah, but what we strive to do is to give them some technique that an operations person, like a sysadmin or something like that, could apply to check to see if the defense is in place. You can't always do this, but I'm telling you, you can do it about 80, 90% of the time, and it provides that extra value. It doesn't take that much longer to do, but you could ask any of the guys that work for me at CounterHack. Every single time we have a finding, we strive to put in there saying, here's how you fix this. Sometimes there's multiple different recommendations. And then here's how you check to see if that fix is in place. Whether it's a patch, whether it's reconfiguration, whether it's changing a business process, and, and showing them ways that they can evaluate it and retest it. That one's an important one. Next, reject bad copy and paste and insist on useful results. You can't really see it in this slide, but that's a, that's a thing that says paste on it. I, I actually made this uh, slide two days ago, and I, I taped on there, pasted it. I admit this might look like I'm sniffing glue. I'm not. All right. You can see I've got, I've got the, uh, the, the little um, uh, flash sign in there because I was pasting them to the back of the pillows because they're my best friends, right? Anyway, look, if your pen testers are just copying and pasting output from their vulnerability scanners and delivering that to you saying, there's your pen test, there are companies that do this. I read their reports regularly as part of my expert witness work. This is really bad. This is a disaster. Um, they need to provide really useful results, actionable results that your operations team can apply in their day-to-day -day work. Copy and paste might be a way that you start writing your report, but it's not going to be the way that you finish writing your report. You need to tailor it and focus it. Let me give you a couple tips for report writing. You ready? You want this? Wow, you guys seem so thrilled. Now, this is important stuff. So, tips for report writing. This is stuff that I assumed every single person knew, but I found that some people on my staff didn't know this. And I told them, they're like, well, that's a great idea. And I'm like, well, I've, I've, 
I've always written reports this way. I never knew there was another way to write reports. Here's the deal. While you're doing your pen test, take screenshots, right? When you write your report, put your screenshots in first. Then you add the narrative around that. The screenshots are essentially the tent poles of your report, and you just stitch together the screenshots. There you go. Your presentation, your, your, uh, presentation plus the actual report itself is going to be tremendously better for doing just that. I thought everyone knew that. Apparently not. Some people are shaking their head, nodding their head because they know. So do your screenshots while you're doing your pen test. You write your report. You just stitch all the screenshots together, and it's an awesome report. Dude, nice. Next. I thought everybody knew this one as well. Before you deliver your report, read it out loud. When I read the reports of everybody on my team, I sit on my couch and I read them out loud. My ear picks up things that my brain wouldn't unless I was reading it out loud. I thought everyone did this, but we were talking to the guys on my team, and we said, you know, do you read this out loud? Well, no, why would I do that? B because you, you have to. <laughs> Every time we write a report, Josh Wright is so good at this stuff, he's a report fanatic. He writes three things. To, so, so if, say, Jeff McJunkin writes a report, or, or Ron Bowes writes a report, or somebody else on the team writes a report, what, jo what, what Josh does is he reviews the report, first round, and then he will send them, hey, read your report, very good, or maybe not so good. Here's three things I want you to work on next time you create the report. And this is great advice. We're hoping to make these guys better for their future iterations of work for us, and then additionally further on in their career. So two little tips on how to create your reports. Even if you're a forensics person, even if you're a cyber defender, still, tent poles and screenshots, read it out loud before you finish it. Next. Insist that business, oh, understand that business-focused results might cost a little bit more. They do. If you're looking for the lowest cost pen test, it's probably not going to adhere to the principles I've been advising you about for the last 45 minutes or so. Sorry, this costs a little more. Not a whole lot more. Don't let get pen testers get greedy. I was trying to emote greedy here. That's, that's all I got. I showed this one to my wife. She's like, that doesn't look greedy. You just look weird. Look, it's the best I got, OK? That's all I got. Anyway, don't let pen testers get greedy, but realize this will cost you more, whether it's an in-house pen tester in salary or whether it's a third-party pen test from a pen test company. Next. Oh, kill Java. Kill Flash wherever you can. Now, I realize some places you can't. So try to containerize it, try to sandbox it, whatever you can. And dude, block SMB where you can. Client to client SMB, think about that. Private VLANs or whatever else you can do to filter client to client SMB. How many people here have WebEx on their Windows boxes in their environment? I should ask how many people don't. How many people have no idea? You have no idea because somebody is invited to a WebEx. Think about that. If I can get SMB access, as just a regular user, I can run things with system privileges on your box. Well, unless you apply the patch that Cisco released yesterday. OK, how many people have applied the patch? Thanks, Ted. Excellent. So think about this. you got to block this. And it's not just client to client. Obviously, client to client is the low-hanging fruit. But also, server to server, you do need some of that. But where you don't need it, block it. Client to server, you probably need some of that. You need to authenticate to your domain controllers, right? And, well, your clients need to mount file shares and stuff like that. That's understandable. But limit it. Limit the SMB wherever you can. SMB is my best friend. I love that protocol. What a great thing to hack across. And I think that web exec thing, I was so delighted when we got it released yesterday because then I was able to talk about it today as an illustration of why you need to block this. All right, cool. Next. Oh, that gun, by the way, there. That's a 1690 Spanish uh, firearm. How about that? Next. Offensive countermeasures are awesome. You heard that Bill Stearns is sitting in the back of the room. Hey, Bill. Bill Stearns is sitting in the back of the room running a CTF for offensive countermeasures. I was talking with Kevin Fiscus a couple of months ago, and Fiscus was looking at some of John Strand's work on offensive countermeasures. John's got a book out. He's, uh, he's got a class that he's done. Um, he does it at Black Hat. He, he's uh, done it at Sands. Anyway, Kevin Fiscus was looking over this work. And Kevin was like, you know, offensive countermeasures, yeah, that's kind of cool. Seems like a neat idea, whatever, whatever, whatever. And then Kevin told me this. He said, I was thinking about it, and it occurred to me, because Kevin's a pen tester. He said, if I was doing a pen test against an organization that was using just one third of all of these offensive countermeasures that John Strand recommends, that would suck for me. My goal in this presentation is to help you make pen testers' lives suck more. Yes. And offensive countermeasures are one important technique for you to apply to that. 
offensive cars are fantastic stuff. Talk to Bill Stearns about it. Play that CTF. What a neat idea for a CTF. Also, look at John Strand's writings and work on offensive countermeasure, active defense. Awesome stuff. Really, really cool. And that's going to bring us to a conclusion. Then we'll open it up for as much Q&A as John Strand will let me do. So conclusion, with your help, we can make pen testers' lives miserable. No, that, that's not the actual conclusion, but it's close. The actual conclusion is, with your help, we can make pen testing so much more valuable. And I have one more thing I want to tell you about before we move to Q&A. All right, next one, final slide. So this week, it was Tuesday, we did a soft launch, and then we officially announced it Wednesday. Um, LineCon for Holiday Hack 2018. How many people here have played Holiday Hack at some point in their lives? Oh, that's great. We've done 15 years of them. There's over 15 of these things out there. Um, we are doing a rolled release, a rolling release of Holiday Hack Challenge 2018. The concept is this. In 2015, there was a nasty attack against, well, the whole infrastructure of the holiday season. What happened was a nefarious attacker Play, uh, sold these things called Gnome in Your Home. Sold it to over two million households across the world. And these little kids discovered that the gnomes actually had a camera for their eye and they were streaming photos from the houses of the people who bought the gnome in the home. And what happened was Cindy Lou Who, age 62, was gathering all this stuff and crowdsourcing burglaries so people would steal all their Christmas presents. She was trying to destroy Christmas in a way the Grinch was unable to achieve. That was in 2015. 2016, someone kidnaps Santa Claus, and Santa Claus's business card is just laying on the ground. Somebody cracked a Christmas tree over Santa Claus's head. You have to investigate what happened, and you get into the North Pole, you start looking around for this, and you realize there is a time-traveling train that takes you to 1978. You rescue Santa from 1978. This is still up on the internet. You can download this thing, video game included. And you rescue Santa, you still don't know who the bad guy is. You then investigate even further. You gotta do some correlation, some analysis, so you need to discover that the bad guy is, anybody remember? Doctor Who, yes, you're right. Doctor Who was the bad guy. So Cindy Lou Who was the bad guy in 2015. Doctor Who was in 2016. 2017, there's almost a war between Oz and the North Pole. The elves and the munchkins are about to go to battle, and they're being incited by these giant snowballs that are falling down the mountain of the North Pole. You have to investigate what's going on and gather the pieces of the great book, this epic tome of the history of the North Pole and Oz. And as you get to the end of it, you find out who's the bad guy? Glinda, the good witch of Oz, the so-called good witch. That was the 2017 version. So here's the deal, for 2018, Santa is mad. He is upset. Over the last three years, holiday supervillains have plotted to destroy the North Pole or the whole holiday season. So he has called together a conference at the North Pole. Transportation will be provided via an HTML browser, HTML5 browser. You could register for it. Just go to KringleCon with a K and a C, KringleCon.com. You can register, you create a little avatar. We've opened LineCon so you can kind of walk around, you can chat with other people. You can make teams. We encourage you to play as a team. It's a social thing, you can talk. It's just LineCon right now. We launched registration in July. We launched LineCon this week. And then the whole thing is gonna go into production second week of December. And that's when, do you wanna hear a little secret about this? Okay, this person does. Come up afterwards and I'll tell you, okay? Yeah. Yeah, maybe I should tell everybody. So here's the deal. When this thing opens in December, you're going to go in there, and it's going to be a conference. It's an information security conference that we're hosting. We've got a wonderful speaker named Dave Kennedy. Ladies and gentlemen, Dave Kennedy, yay! I, uh, Dave was the first person outside of CounterHack to know about KringleCon. I told him, actually, it was last October, right before World Wild West Hacking Fest. Anyway, so Dave Kennedy's going to be speaking there. We're going to have a whole bunch of other great speakers for you. But once you've been in this thing for about an hour, after it launches in December, Something weird's gonna happen, and the game will be afoot, all right? So anyway, that's what we have for you, holidayhackchallenge.com. If you go there, it's got a link to kringlecon.com. You can register now, start talking to people, chatting, create your avatar, look around, there's stuff to be found, there's stuff to be hacked, even now. So enjoy, thank you.
as much time as you'd like, as little time as you'd like. Well, thank you very much, Ed. If anybody has any questions, come on up. We got a microphone. That way we don't have to shout relays all the way down. So who has the first question? Who has the second question? There we go. I didn't know walking would be involved. <laughs> so you mentioned an IoT uh, pen testing engagement. Yes. Um, I've tried to find information on those in the past and it just doesn't seem like much of a thing. Yeah. Do you have any recommendations for finding jobs in that or how to culture that environment a bit more? Yeah, the, the, the gentleman's question, if you didn't hear it, was IoT. He, he, he wants to do IoT pen testing. He's looked for things to kind of help with that. The thing about IoT pen testing that is so great but also so scary is there's so much involved. With modern IoT stuff, usually you have mobile, wireless, embedded, web, network, cloud mixed together. What could possibly go wrong, right? There was something that Larry Pesci, Larry's here at the event. I don't know if he's here at this, is he here right now? Larry Pesci released something about a year and a half, maybe two years ago, called the IoT Attack Framework. It's called IOTA, and it's at the inguardians.com website. And it kind of maps out the attack surface of your typical IoT infrastructure, everything I just described, but it also gives you specific recommendations of tools and techniques you can apply to attack that stuff. The IOTA, that's the IoT attack framework in guardians.com. I think you'll like it. Thank you. Thank you. Time and for thank one you, Larry. More question. Don't thank me. Thank Larry. He did all the work. I just pushed him to say, Larry, can you release it now? <laughs> Another question. Yes, sir. Okay. Yep. I just have a couple questions. One, um, so for people who are pursuing pen testers to hire them, uh, what we've heard is that you need to keep getting different pen testers every time so that you're not hiring from the same company. So that's one question. The second yeah. question. Can I answer the first one first? Because yes, I'll, I'll forget it. So the, the question is this Should I hire a different pen tester every time I do a pen test? I understand the value of diversity and getting a second opinion in there. That said, I also understand the value of having the pen tester who did my pen test before throw something new at me or something different, or I've tried to evolve. I want to see if my evolution will be caught by them. And if they're not, I don't have a baseline of standard to compare it to. So what do you do? My answer is both. Right? How often do you append, do, do a pen test? Maybe one out of every n, you have somebody else do it. But n minus one are done by the same organization. I think that creates the healthiest thing in there. And look, if that nth one is done by a company that just blows your socks off, maybe you transition to them. So I think you need both. You need commonality and consistency, but you also need diversity. So both. Awesome. Thanks for that answer. The second question is, uh, you're talking about evaluating pen testers. Do you think eventually we'll have like a Yelp for pen testers where <laughs> you can go and rate, okay, these are good ones. These it's are interesting, good. interesting idea. Um, so the gentleman's question is, you know, evaluating pen test companies and so forth, do you think eventually we'll have a Yelp for pen testing? That would be interesting and a delight, but the thing of it is, who's neutral in this industry? I mean, there's so many people that, I mean, if you want somebody that understands pen testing really, really well, they probably do pen testing. Now you might say, well, what about Gartner and such? But I mean, we're talking really deep technical Analytics. No offense to my Gartner friends, but really deep technical stuff. Um, I think you should insist on getting an example of their reports. It is amazing to me how crappy some of the example reports are that pen tester companies will provide you. And they're signaling to you. It almost says, do not hire me in these sample reports they send you. So insist on getting a sample report, number one. Number two, look at what the pen test company has contributed to the community. Are they releasing stuff? Are they doing presentations? Are they talking publicly? Are they trying to improve the state of pen testing? Because I think there is a huge correlation between those companies that are trying to improve the state of pen testing and those companies that actually do high quality pen testing, right? So look for that. Look at what they're doing in the community. Look at their blogs, all that kind of stuff. There's a, there's a, there's a lot of very good pen test companies. I get asked all the time for people, they say, who should I do a pen test with? And obviously, I'm biased. I mean, I do pen testing myself, right? And my company does pen testing. But we're small. We're much smaller than Black Hills. We're much smaller than Trusted Sec. We're smaller than InGuardians. So we're, we're usually pretty picky and choosy on the pen tests we do. We try to pick pen tests that are going to give us ideas for Holiday Hack Challenge and Net Wars in Cyber City. That's how we choose them. Um, and then what I do is I send the work to these other folks, and hopefully they can do it. Um, I, most pen tests that come to me, I send off to other people and say, I can't do it. We just don't have time. We're too busy trying to get Holiday Hack Challenge out the door. So my point here is, look at their sample report, look at what they do for the community, their reputation, and also ask around. We have a mailing list, we call it GPWN, G -P -W -N. anybody can subscribe, but officially it's for people who've taken a SANS pen test course. On the GPWN mailing list, they very often, somebody will ask a question, I gotta get a pen test, who should I go to? And 
people will say, go to Black Hills, go to Trusted Sec. They'll often say, you know, go to InGuardians. Josh Wright sent me an email saying, Ed, they never say go to CounterHack. That's so sad. That makes me sad. And I said, Josh, you realize I turned down most work that comes to us. That's why they, that's why they didn't say go to us. But the fact is, now I'm not saying that don't come to me with work, but don't be surprised if I do send it to some of these other companies. And engage in mailing lists. There are companies, not just the ones that I've listed here, there are companies with fantastic reputations. There really are. Great questions. Thank you so much. All right, and that's going to wrap it up. A round of applause for Ed Skotas, please. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Enjoy Wild West Hackin' Fest. John, thank you for all you thank do you. for the community. You rock, dude.